As much as Dad liked to tell stories about himself, it was almost impossible to get him to talk about his parents or where he was born. We knew he came from a town called Welch, in West Virginia, where a lot of coal was mined, and that his father had worked as a clerk for the railroad, sitting every day in a little station house writing messages on pieces of paper that he held up on a stick for the passing train engineers. Dad had no interest in a life like that, so he left Welch when he was 17 to join the Air Force and become a pilot. One of his favorite stories, which he must have told us a hundred times, was about how he met and fell in love with Mom. Dad was in the air, force, and mom was in the USO, but when they met, she was on leave, visiting her parents at their cattle ranch near Fish Creek Canyon. Dad and some of his Air Force buddies were on a cliff of the canyon, trying to work up the nerve to dive into the lake 40 feet below, when mom and a friend drove up. Mom was wearing a white bathing suit that showed off her figure and her skin, which was dark from the Arizona sun. She had light brown hair that turned blonde in the summer, and she never wore any makeup except deep red lipstick. She looked just like a movie star, Dad always said, but hell, he'd met lots of beautiful women. before and none of them had ever made him weak in the knees. Mom was different. He saw right away that she had true spirit. He fell in love with her the split second he laid eyes on her. Mom walked up to the Air Force men and told them that diving off the cliff was no big deal. She'd been doing it since she was little. The men didn't believe her. So mom went right to the edge of the cliff and did a perfect swan dive into the water below. Dad jumped in after her. No way in hell, he'd say, was he letting a fine broad like that get away from him. What kind of dive did you do, dad? I asked whenever he told the story. A parachute dive, without a parachute. He always answered. Dad swam after Mom, and right there in the water, he told her he was going to marry her. Twenty-three men had already proposed to her, Mom, told Dad, and she had turned them all down. What makes you think I'd accept your proposal? She asked. I didn't propose to you, Dad said. I told you I was going to marry you. Six months later, they got married. I always thought it was the most romantic story I'd ever heard, but mom didn't like it. She didn't think it was romantic at all. I had to say yes. Mom said, your father wouldn't take no for an answer. Besides, she explained, she had to get away from her mother. Who wouldn't let her make even the smallest decision on her own? I had no idea your father would be even worse. Dad left the Air Force after he got married because he wanted to make a fortune for his family, and you couldn't do that in the military. In a few months, Mom was pregnant. When Lori came out, she was mute and bald, as an egg for the first three years of her life. Then suddenly, she sprouted, curly hair the color of a new penny and started speaking non-stop. But it sounded like gibberish, and everyone thought she was addled except for Mom, who understood her perfectly and said she had an excellent vocabulary. A year after Lori was born, mom and dad had a second daughter, Mary. Charlene, who
who had coal black hair and chocolate brown eyes, just like dad. But Mary Charlene died one night when she was nine months old. Crib death, mom always said. Two years later, I was born. You were too. Replace Mary Charlene, mom said. She told me that she had ordered up a second red-headed girl so Lori wouldn't feel like she was weird. You were such a skinny baby. Mom used to tell me. The longest, boniest thing the nurses had ever seen. Brian arrived when I was one. He was a blue baby, Mom said. When he was born, he couldn't breathe and came into this world having a seizure. Whenever mom told the story, she would hold her arms rigid and clench. Her teeth and go bug-eyed to show how Brian looked. Mom said when she saw him like that, she thought, uh-oh, looks like this one's a goner. 2. But Brian lived. For the first year of his life, he kept having those. Seizures. Then one day they just stopped. He turned into a tough little guy, who never whined or cried, even the time I accidentally pushed him off. The top bunk and he broke his nose. Mom always said people worried too much about their children. Suffering when you're young is good for you, she said. It immunized your body and your soul, and that was why she ignored us kids when we cried. Fussing over children who cry only encourages them, she told us. That's positive reinforcement for negative behavior. Mom never seemed upset about Mary Charlene's death. God knows what he's doing, she said. He gave me some perfect children, but he also gave me one that wasn't so perfect, so he said. Oops. I better take this one back. Dad, however, wouldn't talk about Mary Charlene. If her name came up, his face grew stony and he'd leave the room. He was the one who found her body in the crib, and Mom couldn't believe how much. It shook him up. When he found her, he stood there like he was in shock. Or something cradling her stiff little body in his arms, and then he screamed like a wounded animal. She told us, I never heard such a horrible sound. Mom said dad was never the same after Mary Charlene died. He started having dark moods, staying out late and coming home drunk, and losing jobs. One day soon after Brian was born, we were short on cash, so dad pawned mom's big diamond wedding ring, which her mother had paid for, and that upset mom. After that, whenever mom and dad got in a fight, mom brought up the ring, and dad told her to quit her damn belly aching. He'd say he was going to get her a ring even fancier than the one he pawned. That was why we had to find gold. To get mom a new wedding ring. That and so we could build the glass castle. Do you like always moving around? Lori asked me. Of course I do. I said. Don't you? Sure. She said. It was late afternoon. And we were parked outside of a bar in the Nevada. Desert. It was called the Bar Nun Bar. I was four and Lori was seven. We were on our way to Las Vegas. Dad had decided it would be easier, as he put it, to accumulate the capital necessary to finance the prospector. If he hit the casinos for a while, we'd been driving for hours when he saw the bar nun bar, pulled over the green caboose, the blue goose, had died. And we now had another car, a station wagon dad had named. The green caboose, 
and announced that he was going inside for a quick nip. Mom put on some red lipstick and joined him, even though she didn't drink anything stronger than tea. They had been inside for hours. The sun hung high in the sky, and there was not the slightest hint of a breeze. Nothing moved except some buzzards on the side of the road, pecking over an unrecognizable carcass. Brian was reading a dog-eared comic book. How many places have we lived? I asked Lori. That depends on what you mean by lived. She said, if you spend one night in some town, did you live there? What about two nights? Er a whole week, I thought. If you unpack all your things, I said. We counted 11 places we had lived, then we lost track. We couldn't remember the names of some of the towns or what the houses we had lived in looked like. Mostly, I remembered the inside of cars. What do you think would happen if we weren't always moving around? I asked. We'd get caught. Lori said, when mom and dad came out of the bar, none bar, they brought us each a long piece of beef jerky and a candy bar. I ate the jerky first, and by the time I unwrapped my mounds bar, it had melted into a brown, gooey mess, so I decided to save it until night. When the desert cold would harden it up again, by then we had passed through the small town beyond the bar nun bar. Dad was driving and smoking with one hand and holding a brown bottle of beer with the other. Lori was in the front seat between him and Mom. And Brian, who was in back with me, was trying to trade me half of his three musketeers for half of my mounds. Just then we took a sharp turn over some railroad tracks, the door flew open, and I tumbled out of the car. I rolled several yards along the embankment, and when I came to a stop, I was too shocked to cry, with my breath knocked out and grit and pebbles in my eyes and mouth. I lifted my head in time to watch the green caboose get smaller and smaller and then disappear around a bend. Blood was running down my forehead and flowing out of my nose. My knees and elbows were scraped raw and covered with sand. I was still holding the mound's bar, but I had smashed it during the fall, tearing the wrapper and squeezing out the white coconut filling, which was also covered with grit. Once I got my breath back, I crawled along the railroad embankment to the road and sat down to wait for mom and dad to come back. My whole body felt sore. The sun was small and white and broiling hot. A wind had come up, and it was roiling the dust along the roadside. I waited for what seemed like a long time before I decided it was possible mom and dad might not come back for me. They might not notice I was missing. They might decide that it wasn't worth the drive back to retrieve me, that, like Quixote the cat, I was a bother and a burden they could do without. The little town behind me was quiet, and there were no other cars on the road. I started crying, but that only made me feel more sore. I got up and began to walk back toward the houses, and then I decided that if mom and dad did come for me, they wouldn't be able to find me, so I returned to the railroad tracks and sat down again. I was scraping the dried blood off my legs when I looked up and saw the green caboose come back around the bend. It hurtled up the road toward me getting bigger and bigger, until it screeched to a halt right in front of me. Dad got out of the car, 
knelt down, and tried to give me a hug. I pulled away from him. I thought you were going to leave me behind. Quote, I said, ah, oh, I'd never do that. He said, your brother was trying to tell us that. You'd fallen out, but he was blubbering so damned hard we couldn't understand a word he was saying. Dad started pulling the pebbles out of my face. Some were buried deep in my skin, so he reached into the glove compartment for a pair of needle-nosed pliers. When he'd plucked all the pebbles from my cheeks and forehead, he took out his handkerchief and tried to stop my nose from bleeding. It was dripping like a broken faucet. Damn, honey, he said, you busted your snot locker pretty good. I started laughing really hard. Snot locker was the funniest name I'd ever heard for a nose. After dad cleaned me up and I got back in the car, I told Brian and Lori and Mom about the word, and they all started laughing as hard as me. Snot locker. It was hilarious. We lived in LAS Vegas for about a month, in a motel room with dark red walls and two narrow beds. We three kids slept in one, Mom and Dad in the other. During the day, we went to the casinos, where dad said he had a shore fire system for beating the house. Brian and I played hide and seek among the clicking slot machines, checking the trays for overlooked quarters, while dad was winning money at the blackjack table. I'd stare at the long-legged showgirls when they sashayed across the casino floor with huge feathers on their heads and behinds, sequins sparkling on their bodies, and glitter around their eyes. When I tried to imitate their walk, Brian said I looked like an ostrich. At the end of the day, Dad came to get us, his pockets full of money. He bought us cowboy hats and fringed vests, and we ate chicken fried steaks in restaurants with ice-cold air conditioning and a miniature jukebox at each table. One night when Dad had made an especially big score, he said it was time to start living like the high rollers we had become. He took us to a restaurant with swinging doors like a saloon. Inside, the walls were decorated with real prospecting tools. A man with garters on, his arms played a piano, and a woman with gloves that came up past her. Elbows kept hurrying over to light Dad's cigarettes. Dad told us we were having something special for dessert, a flaming ice cream cake. The waiter wheeled out a tray with the cake on it, and the woman with the gloves lit it with a taper. Everyone stopped eating too. Watch. The flames had a slow, watery movement, rolling up into the air. Like ribbons. Everyone started clapping, and Dad jumped up and raised the waiter's hand above his head as if he'd won first prize. A few days later, Mom and Dad went off to the blackjack table and then almost immediately came looking for us. Dad said one of the dealers had figured out that he had a system and had put the word out on him. He told us it was time to do the skedaddle. We had to get far away from Las Vegas, Dad said, because the mafia, which owned the casinos, was after him. We headed west, through desert and then mountains. Mom said we should all live near the Pacific Ocean at least once in our lives, so we kept going all the way to San Francisco. Mom didn't want us staying in one of those tourist trap hotels near Fisherman's Wharf, which she said were inauthentic and cut off from the 
real life of the city, so we found one that had a lot more character, in a place called the Tenderloin District. Sailors and women with lots of makeup stayed there, too. Dad called it a flop house, but Mom said it was an SRO, and when I asked what that stood for, she told me the hotel was for special residents only. While Mom and Dad went out looking for investment money for the prospector, we kids played in the hotel. One day I found a half full box of matches. I was thrilled because I much preferred the wooden matches that came in boxes over the flimsy ones in the cardboard books. I took them upstairs and locked myself in the bathroom. I pulled off some toilet paper, lit it, and when it started burning, I threw it down the toilet. I was torturing the fire, giving it life, and snuffing it out. Then I got a better idea. I made a pile of toilet paper in the toilet, lit it, and when it started burning, the flame shooting silently up out of the bowl, one flushed it down the toilet. One night a few days later, I suddenly woke up. The air was hot and stifling. I smelled smoke and then saw flames leaping at the open window. At first I couldn't tell if the fire was inside or outside, but then I saw that one of the curtains, only a few feet from the bed, was ablaze. Mom and Dad were not in the room, and Lori and Brian were still asleep. I tried to scream to warn them, but nothing came out of my throat. I wanted to reach over and shake them awake, but I couldn't move. The fire was growing bigger, stronger, and angrier. Just then the door burst open. Someone was calling our names. It was Dad. Lori and Brian woke up and ran to him, coughing from the smoke. I still couldn't move. I watched the fire, expecting that at any moment my blanket would burst into flames. Dad wrapped the blanket around me and picked me up, then ran down the stairs, leading Lori and Brian with one arm and holding me in the other. Dad took us kids across the street to a bar, then went back to help fight the fire. A waitress with red fingernails and blue-black hair asked if we wanted a Coca-Cola or, heck, even a beer, because we'd been through a lot that night. Brian and Lori said yes, please, to Cokes. I asked if I might please have a Shirley Temple, which was what Dad bought me. Whenever he took me to a bar, for some reason, the waitress laughed. The people at the bar kept making jokes about women running naked out of the burning hotel. All I had on was my underwear, so I kept the blanket wrapped tightly around me. After I drank my Shirley Temple, I tried to go back across the street to watch the fire, but the waitress kept me at the bar so I climbed up on a stool to watch through the window. The fire trucks had arrived. There were flashing lights and men in black, rubber coats holding canvas hoses with big jets of water coming out of them. I wondered if the fire had been out to get me. I wondered if all fire was related. Like Dad said all humans were related, if the fire that had burned me that day while I cooked hot dogs was somehow connected to the fire I had flushed down the toilet and the fire burning at the hotel. I didn't have the answers to those questions, but what I did know was that I lived in a world that at any moment could erupt into fire. It was the sort of knowledge that kept you on your toes.
After the hotel burned down, we lived for a few days on the beach. When we put down the backseat of the green caboose, there was room for everyone to sleep, though sometimes someone's feet would be sticking in my face. One night a policeman tapped on our window and said we had to leave. It was illegal to sleep on the beach. He was nice and kept calling us folks and even drew us a map to a place where we could sleep without getting arrested. But after he left, dad called him the goddamn Gestapo and said that people like that got their jollies pushing people like us around. Dad was fed up with civilization. He and mom decided we should move back to the desert and resume our hunt for gold without our starter money. These cities will kill you, he said. After we pulled up stakes in San Francisco, we headed for the Mojave Desert. Near the Eagle Mountains, Mom made Dad stop the car. She'd seen a tree on the side of the road that had caught her fancy. It wasn't just any tree. It was an ancient Joshua tree. It stood in a crease of land where the desert ended and the mountain began, forming a wind tunnel. From the time the Joshua tree was a tiny sapling, it had been so beaten down by the whipping wind that, rather than trying to grow skyward, it had grown in the direction that the wind pushed it. It existed now in a permanent state of wind blindness, leaning over so far that it seemed ready to topple, although, in fact, its roots held it firmly in place. I thought the Joshua tree was ugly. It looked scraggly and freakish, permanently stuck in its twisted, tortured position, and it made me think. O.F. how some adults tell you not to make weird faces because your features could freeze. Mom, however, thought it was one of the most beautiful trees she had ever seen. She told us she had to paint it. While she was setting out her easel, Dad drove up the road to see what was ahead. He found a scattering of parched little houses trailers settling into the sand, and shacks with rusty tin roofs. It was called Midland. One of the little houses had a for rent sign. What the hell? Dad said, this place is as good as any other. The house we rented had been built by a mining company. It was white, with two rooms and a sway-backed roof. There were no trees, and the Desert sand ran right up to the back door. At night you could hear coyotes howling. When we first got to Midland, those coyotes kept me awake, and as I lay in bed, I'd hear other sounds, Gila monsters rustling in the underbrush, moths knocking against the screens, and the creosote crackling in the wind. One night when the lights were out and I could see a sliver of moon through the window, I heard a slithering noise on the floor. I think there's something under our bed. I said to Lori, it's merely a figment of your overly active imagination. Lori said, she talked like a grown-up when she was annoyed. I tried to be brave, but I had heard something. In the moonlight, I thought I saw it move. Something's there, I whispered. Go to sleep, Lori said. Holding my pillow over my head for protection, I ran into the living room where Dad was reading. What's up, Mountain Goat? He asked. He called me that because I never fell down when we were climbing. Mountains. Sure-footed as a mountain goat, he'd always say. Nothing. Probably. I said. I just think maybe I saw something in the bedroom. 
Dad raised his eyebrows. But it was probably just a figment of my overly active imagination. Did you get a good look at it? He asked. Not really. You must have seen it. Was it a big old hairy son of a bitch with the damnedest looking teeth and claws? That's it. And did it have pointed ears and evil eyes with fire in them? And did it stare at you all wicked like? He asked. Yes. Yes. You've seen it, too. Better believe I have. It's that old ornery bastard demon. Dad said he had been chasing demon for years. By now, Dad said that old demon had figured out that it had better not mess with Rex walls. But if that sneaky son of a gun thought it was going to terrorize Rex Walls's little girl, it had by God got another think coming. Go fetch my hunting knife, Dad said. Dot. I got dad his knife with the carved bone handle and the blade of blue German steel, and he gave me a pipe wrench, and we went looking for demon. We looked under my bed, where I had seen it, but it was gone. We looked all around the house, under the table, in the dark corners of the closets, in the toolbox even outside in the trash cans. Come here, you sorry ass old demon. Dad called out in the desert night. Come out and show your butt ugly face, you yellow bellied monster. Yeah, come on, you old mean demon. I said, waving the pipe wrench in the air. We're not scared of you. There was only the sound of the coyotes in the distance this is just like that chicken shit demon dad said he sat down on the front step and lit up a cigarette then told me a story about the time demon was terrorizing an entire town and dad fought it off in hand-to-hand -hand combat biting its ears and sticking his fingers in its eyes old demon was terrified because that was the first time it had met anyone who wasn't afraid of it. Damned old demon didn't know what to think. Dad said, shaking his head with a chuckle. That was the thing to remember about all monsters. Dad said, they love to frighten people, but the minute you stare them down, they turn tail and run. All you have to do, mountain goat, is show old demon that you're not afraid not much grew around midland other than the joshua tree cacti and the scrubby little creosote bushes that dad said were some of the oldest plants on the planet the great granddaddy creosote bushes were thousands of years old when it rained they let off a disgusting musty smell so animals wouldn't eat them only four inches of rain fell a year, around Midland, about the same as in the northern Sahara, and water. For humans came in on the train once a day in special containers. The only animals that could survive around Midland were lipless, scaly, creatures such as Gila monsters and scorpions, and people like us. A month after we moved to Midland, Juju got bitten by a rattlesnake and died. We buried him near the Joshua tree. It was practically the only time I ever saw Brian cry. But we had plenty of cats to keep us company. Too many, in fact. We had rescued lots of cats since we tossed Quixote out the window, and most of them had gone and had kittens, and it got too the point where we had to get rid of some of them. We didn't have many neighbors to give them to, so dad put them in a burlap sack and drove to a pond made by the mining company to cool equipment. I watched him load the back of the car with bobbing, 
mewing bags. It doesn't seem right. I told mom. We rescued them. Now we're going to kill them. We gave them a little extra time on the planet. Mom said. They should be grateful for that. Dad finally got a job in the gypsum mine, digging out the white rocks that were ground into the powder used in drywall and plaster of Paris. When he came home, he'd be covered with white gypsum powder, and sometimes we'd play ghost and he'd chase us. He also brought back sacks of gypsum, and Mom mixed it with water to make Venus de Milo. Sculptures from a rubber cast she ordered through the mail. It grieved. Mom that the mine was destroying so much white rock, she said it was real marble and deserved a better fate than that, by making her sculptures. She was at least immortalizing some of it. Mom was pregnant. Everyone hoped it would be a boy so Brian would have someone to play with other than me. When it got time for Mom to give birth, Dad's plan was for us to move to Blythe, 20 miles south. Which was such a big town it had two movie theaters and two state prisons. In the meantime, Mom devoted herself to her art. She spent all day working on oil paintings, watercolors, charcoal drawings, pen and ink, sketches, clay and wire sculptures, silk screens, and wood blocks. She didn't have any particular style. Some of her paintings were what she called primitive, some were impressionistic and abstract, some were realistic. I don't want to be pigeonholed. She liked to say, Mom was also a writer and was always typing away on novels, short stories, plays poetry, fables, and children's books, which she illustrated herself. Mom's writing was very creative. So was her spelling. She needed a proofreader. And when Lori was just seven years old, she would go over Mom's manuscripts, checking for errors. While we were in Midland, Mom painted dozens of variations and studies of the Joshua tree. We'd go with her and she'd give us art lessons. One time I saw a tiny Joshua tree sapling growing not too far from the old tree. I wanted to dig it up and replant it near our house. I told mom that I would protect it from the wind and water it every day so that it could grow nice and tall and straight. Mom frowned at me. You'd be destroying what makes it special. She said, it's the Joshua tree's struggle that gives it its beauty.